All right. Hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Content at the Davis Finney Foundation, and I am here today with Terry Keys. How are you doing, Terry? I'm doing terrific, Mel. Thanks for inviting me here. Well, I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, can you tell us about who you are and why you, why you are here? Okay. Well, I'm Terry Keys, and I am a former caregiver in the sense that I took care of my husband throughout the last long stretch of his life when he had Parkinson's disease. And I'm also an author because I've just written and published a book about that whole experience of caregiving. Yeah. Okay, great. So did you then, um, were you writing the book as you were caregiving? Was this a post, like, you know, post scar kind of writing? Like, how did that work? Well, I mean, I always paid attention to what I was experiencing and I posted of all sorts of places online, you know, my questions and my experiences and learned from other people. But then after Peter had passed away, I was at a sort of wellness retreat, kind of get, regathering myself. And I asked the question, is it possible to have a happy marriage, a happy life when a partner has a disease like Parkinson's disease? And then I started writing the answer. And two and a half years later, the book was the result of the answer to that question. Oh, wow. So that, that, that question came after he passed. Yes. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Was, wow. we, we were very happy and it was tough. It was not always easy, but it was always good. Does that make sense to say yeah. that? That's yeah, how absolutely. Was. So when you, um, how long, how long was he living with Parkinson's while, while you were married? Well, we married, I met him after he'd had Parkinson's for, I think, 12 years when I, I think it was 12 years. And I tried really hard not to get involved with this guy. Um, but he, it just, he was my guy. He was my person. And um, we had a really strong, happy life together. And then Parkinson's started galloping. You know, at first it kind of moves along. But then when it started galloping, it was really pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And... Yet, because we knew who we were, and we we were just we were connected in a really good way, and it allowed me to use experiences and knowledge that I had from earlier parts of my life to be, I think, the best caregiver I knew how to be. Yeah. So, what were some of those? Um, tell us about who you are. You know, pre pre your husband and pre Parkinson's that, um, you know, we, we never get to a book and to this, these roles so, uh, without a whole lot of life. So what happened? Right. Well, there are a lot of pieces that came together for me. I had been a college professor in psychology a long, long time ago and never practiced as a clinician, but I worked using what I learned as a developmental psychologist and a research psychologist to support organizations that work with people who were facing very, very difficult situations. Lots of work with um, organizations that work with domestic violence and child sexual abuse and other kinds of really hard experiences. And I saw my job being to help them offer trauma-informed care to make sure that the services and, and, and attention that they paid to people they were working with honored what has happened to the people in their lives. And what I recognized in myself as a Parkinson's caregiver was I was facing things that overwhelmed my capacity to cope and threatened to overwhelm my capacity to cope. And that's, that's the, the origin of trauma for anybody. I don't talk about it in terms of PTSD, but, um, it was that out of that, and also my work with adults with developmental and cognitive disabilities and TBI, and all of those threads kind of came together in a way that said, maybe you have something to say that will be helpful to other caregivers. Right. What was your What was your husband's name? His name was Peter. Peter. Peter definitely chose you. <laughs> I mean, each other. Wow. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. That's yeah. He did that. You well, you chose each other. Can you talk a little bit about what did it look like when you said it overwhelmed my capabilities? What, what, how did it show up? What was, what was that looking like for you? I think the thing I remember that was hard right away was the sleep deprivation. Mm. When he was waking up all night, I mean, if you're a Parkinson's caregiver, you've experienced this. Your partner wakes up all night long and you can tell how hard he's struggling and how much he's suffering. And I didn't have it in me to just say, you'll be okay, sweetie. Go back to sleep. You know, you're tempted to say that, but you just don't. And so 
the sleep deprivation and the exhaustion were the things that told me this is getting to be hard. And we were lucky enough to have somebody who helped us in our house. And that meant that I was able to get sleep at other times during the day. I was able to take care of myself at least a little bit at other times during the day. And um, it was mostly just really recognizing how much of myself was in the caregiving role and how little of myself um, was available for other parts of my life. Yeah. And how long would you say that that was the dynamic? Oh, at or... least the last six years, oh, which yeah. I know in some people's lives, that's a short time, but yeah, six it years is a lot, right? It didn't, it didn't feel short at the time. Right. Right. And so uh, what were some of the things that you two did as a couple to help your communication to, to, you know, to kind of get what you needed from Peter so that Peter got what he needed from you, uh, you kind of kept yourselves to the best of your ability uh, by also helping each other? Well, we did because he was a very generous man and a very giving man. And so as he did as much as he could and more. And there were times that I had to say, please don't try that. I'll, I'll do it. I can do it for you. I was lucky that he didn't um, put me in the position of having to tell him he couldn't drive anymore. And that was huge because I was really nervous about saying, you can't drive anymore. I mean, right. Insane. And he recognized that on his own. And that was, um, that was a gift to me. You know, it, it, it just, it helped to maintain the sense of, of engagement and love through each other because we did, were able to avoid a lot of struggle. Yeah. And then there was a second kind of phase to that when his awareness of himself and his awareness of his impact on me faded to almost zero. And there, were, there was a moment I remember looking at myself in the mirror one morning and saying, he has nothing for you. And it was heartbreakingly hard, but it was also blindingly true. Mm. And because it was true, I was able to stop aching for what he didn't have. And that meant that I wasn't, I didn't have the same, it was a different disappointment, but it was not the disappointment in him. And it was a disappointment in what Parkinson's had done to us. And that led me to the understanding that Parkinson's is a couple's disease. If you're a person with Parkinson's and you're lucky enough to have a committed partner who's with you for the long run, it's a couple's disease. And I feel like every caregiver finds that out for herself. And without this, you know, the resources of, of organizations like the Davis Finney Foundation, it would be even worse. But almost every caregiver has to come to understand, this is mine too. And, and it's, it's, it's natural to ask for help. It's natural to not be able to do it all. Yeah. You know, you know I think about so many people that um, they get a diagnosis and they end up splitting up for whatever reason, right? It's just, it's too much. Um, and I'm sure that you have, you know, in your research and work with, as a caregiver and writing the book has have talked to so many other caregivers. Yeah. And what are some of the uh, things that you hear that, um, I, I mean, I think we hear a lot of the uh, maybe, times where it's something so severe that they can't come back together. Maybe the person has severe impulse control disorders or, you know, th there's just been irreparable damage to the relationship and there's those situations. But in other situations, you know, what are some of the things that you see as just really damaging to the relationship? If we are going to look at that and say, this is a couple's mm -hmm. disease. Yeah. Well, you know, it starts really early in the process and it's the subtle changes that you notice in your partner. And the thing that crystallizes it is the still face. Because mm. when your partner cannot show the natural kinds of you know, facial reactions when people speak to you and you look at them and so forth, you start to feel like, well, wait, wasn't I here? <laughs> and if you don't know what that is, it feels like your marriage, your relationship is deteriorating. And I know of situations where people split up before the d diagnosis of Parkinson's is made. And then after the fact, it's hard to repair that. Mm, right. And 
I just think every neurologist ought to know one of the things you're going to experience. I mean, I'd love to teach doctors. I would love to be able to talk to doctors about how to talk to Parkinson's caregivers to improve your patient's well-being. Um, but one of the things I think doctors ought to say is notice how it changes things between the two of you and keep track of that and learn, you know, read, find resources to help you learn how to, to make those changes. You really have to let go of the expectation of mutuality. That's so hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Did you, when you met Peter, did you immediately start learning everything you could about Parkinson's? Were you, you know, how did that go for you? Well, I read a lot and I, I had remembered reading, actually seeing films about Parkinson's maybe 20 years before. And I'd had been touched by Parkinson's distantly um, in, in other aspects of my family life, not by anyone I knew personally. So I kind of thought, oh, yeah, I understand this. This is about physical disability. That's what I thought. And I've spent a lot of time with people with disabilities and worked in that world. And so I was like, okay, I, I've got this. If he can't move around, I can do that. And I think for me, the thing that, that first opened my eyes was that we moved out of our life in Chicago to Maine and we bought a sailboat <laughs> and we fitted her out and we spent a lot of time. Some of that may have even been punding with new sails. <laughs> I was right in there with him. So it was mutual punding because we were really excited about this little boat, this little day sailor. And then he couldn't sail. Mm. He had been sailing since he was 12 years old. Oh. And it was demoralizing for him. And it was really sad for me. And it was like we built this, this, this plan for our, our life together. And it was going to be centered around the ability to sail all summer long. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Um, and that told me, you've got to pay attention because you can't dream this marriage. You have mm, to this marriage. I love that. It's going to be what it is. And for me, when you are centered in accepting what is real without blame, and that's the hard part, oh, you should be better. You shouldn't have Parkinson's. Why me? But if stuff happens, always something happens to people. But when you can be this is this centered reality. What do I need? I think caregivers too often tough it out and martyr it out until something is so agonizing that they then think, I need some self-care. Hmm. And I read somewhere, and I wish I knew who had said this first, when that's the moment that you start looking for something, you're looking for aftercare. Yeah. You know? And self-care is knowing early on, which is why I wrote the book, knowing early on things are going to change. Pay attention. Figure out which of these changes you can make easily. Look early. Where do you need help? That's, I think that's part of, of how you hang on to your connection with your partner. Right. Yeah, that um, I, I have a, um, I'm actually, anybody on, if you want to send your question to Terry, just put it in the comment box. Um, we're here and totally open. I love that mug, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, open to listening here. That's a great mug uh, to taking your questions. And I put Terry's uh, website up there so you can find the book and you can learn more about Terry. She also has some cool um, free resources and meditation and all that kind of stuff. Um, her book, though, is called Love, Dignity and Parkinson's uh, from a Care Partner to Caregiver. Um, really, really cool. I do want to talk a little bit about um, that transition because I think that mm -hmm. is such a such a big thing, right? Yes. Um, but going back to this, uh, somebody said to me, or I, I was having a conversation with a friend and they were considering divorce and mm -hmm. somebody, they heard someone say to them, hey, the, the minute you ask, should I stay or should I go, you're already gone, like you're already there, yeah. right? In this case, the minute you say, oh gosh, I, I think I need, like you're, you're far down. Right? right. I need that self-care. This is, this is time um, that you're, you're getting low, right? Your water table. I can talk about a water table a lot. Your water table is low. And right. so as a care partner, um, you know, you for hopefully 
you know, have some of those years early on right. where they're doing okay um, to, you know, varying degrees, but that you can start to kind of set some relationship ground rules in place, if you will, right? Like you'll, this is how we're going to communicate. Oh, um, I'm noticing this. You're noticing that, especially with cognitive issues, right? Like there's probably a, so much communication that has to go on. Um, and as a partner, as a couple, you can kind of increase that water table so that when they do start to decline, you're not operating from nothing. Exactly. Exactly. I, I actually talk about the idea of thirsts and wellsprings in the book because you will feel thirsty. You will feel dry and parched. And if you haven't been building up that wellspring, you know, feeding that stream early on, you can end up really feeling just, you know, I don't want to push that metaphor too far, but you just really feel depleted. Right. You know, I encourage Parkinson's caregivers right away to start making videos and pictures of yourself and your partner together. Um, I realize how few pictures I have of the two of us together. Oh, you know, yeah. I have lots of pictures of Peter, but very few pictures of the two of us. And that's partly because I'm not a fan of the camera, but you will be very happy to see pictures of the two of you smiling at each other. You will be very happy to remember those days because they're in the middle of the night, it's going to come where it's like, who are we? Who yeah. is this person I'm married to? And it's not just men. I mean, people with Parkinson's can be men or women or any gender. And it's, that, it's no respecter of that stuff. Right. But you're in the middle of the night and you, you've got nothing. And yet, if you have something that you've stored up before the fact, and that's why I say self-care is different than aftercare. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's important. Yeah. Kira says, hello, Terry. It's Kira from Black Writers Collective. Oh, hi. Hi. Good to see you. That's fun. Um, Audrey says, I think about the loss of facial expression often wonder about that may be affecting day-to-day -day interactions. I, I think, can yeah. we speak to that for sure? Absolutely, because if you think about how people interact with each other, one of the first cues is, is somebody looking at me? Does their face register that they see me looking at them? I mean, I've done some work on this with parents and kids, and it's called intersubjectivity. It's not just that I see you, but I see you seeing me. And that intersubjectivity is really a critical piece of human communication. And when that's lost, and I think it's lost partly because the face changes, but also because the lack of awareness happens fairly frequently. I mean, and, and I was going to say fairly early, but Parkinson's is so diverse in its presentation that I can't say it's always early. But when a person with Parkinson's kind of gets disconnected from their own experience, um, they can't even tell that they're not letting you see. I'm going to get lost in these. They're not going to know that they haven't let you see them seeing you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I turn to you, Mel, and I say hi, and you, your face changes, your head nods, and there's this, and that breaks, right? But then there's another trick that Parkinson's plays on us because it isn't always broken. So you get used to not having it, and then one day there again she's there again and then it's like oh and your heart swells and you feel better then it's gone but you got to school i think you store that stuff up and realize who your partner is is there anything that you did or any like tips or tricks in terms of communicating with peter about it or what you you know tell other care partners you know i think it's hard for a person with Parkinson's to be told your disease is making you make me lonely. Yeah. That's really hard. Yeah. They're like somebody. that too. Great. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, oh, can I, uh, uh, and then now I'm also hurting you even when I'm just sitting here. And so for me as a care partner, sometimes you have to, well, I mean, you're called on, I think, to hold back the truth in the service of the connection thinking about this this morning and it's almost like if you've operated at this level of engagement and connection when your partner's capacity to engage is reduced 
the only way that I know that for you to continue to feel some reciprocity is for you to bring your expectations to what they're able to do. Mm. What can this person with the um, impact of loss of dopamine and the physical capacity to go and come and the, the lack of understanding of, of com human communication, I have to let myself know that if I touch his hand and he doesn't take his hand away, that counts. Right? It's not much, but you ha I think you have to let that count. It's sort of a Davis Finney thing, let every moment count. Right. And um, this just came to me, but it's also like let every tiny connection like, like take every bit of the joy and the warmth from every tiny communication because that's what you've got. Yeah. 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 So what was the, what were some of the signposts that sort of moved you from, I mean, I read it, but not everyone has read in your book mm -hmm. that moved you from care partner to caregiver. Cause we're, we, we like to be really specific with our words and we're mostly, we mostly say that we're talking to care partners, but that struggle is so big that yeah. that move right from care partner to caregiver. Yeah. That when you become caregiver, I think is when that reciprocity, when that interaction back and forth has started to fail more than it succeeds. And then you really are giving care and you're kind of giving care to the person who was in your life and to the person as they are right now, and also sort of in your mind to the person that they're going to become. And it, it's, it's, it takes a level of maturity. But it, for me, it was that moment of saying, he has nothing for you. Mm -hmm. And there was no anger in that at all. It really, for me, was, I mean, grief. Because mm. I, I knew how much he enjoyed our life together and sailing and gardening and we'd built a little bridge in our house, oh, not in our house, but you know, over in the yard. And we had so much fun with that. And that fun was gone for him. And I sort of saw it as my job to not console him, but to make it okay. Another part of that was recognizing that I did not have to give and I'm going to say this carefully because it's really important to get it right. I didn't have to give everything because if I gave everything, then there's nothing left for the next day and the next week and the next month. Mm. And that meant holding back, going away, um, taking an extra moment. I mean, here's one example that I remember that told me that I, I was learning something about taking care of myself. You know how for many care partners, um, you go to the grocery store and your partner is still able to be at home by themselves. And you like, you feel like you need to rush back as soon as you've gotten that last grocery bag in the car, but maybe you can take that extra five. And I sometimes tell people that the meditation that I wrote, I wrote to be listened to in the car before you start up after that grocery trip and go home because you need that my time. Right. And you're entitled to it before it's desperate. And that for me is like, okay, I can't get that from him anymore because he's given me all that he was ever going to be able to give in his life about love and connection and, and engagement. Yeah. I think a lot of it is partially, you know, you have, let's say you have this five minutes, like just constantly giving yourself permission, Absolutely. constantly giving yourself permission. I get it. Like what really is going to happen in those five minutes? Well, a lot if you take this time to do this meditation. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it, it's it's going to have probably ramifications for the rest of the day, right? Right. You have to you have to fill yourself up and you're entitled to it and you deserve it. You don't have to be guilty. I mean, a lot of caregivers that I, I communicate with talk about feeling guilty if they do something that protects their own well-being. And I want to say stop being guilty. You're not yeah. guilty. You you're you are a partner in this relationship for as long as you can be. And when your partner can no longer care for you, you have to do that job for them. Right. So Kara says, being a care provider takes a lot of energy. Can you share some examples of how you take care of yourself on a day-to-day -day basis? Okay, so the this meditation is one, you know, giving yourself mm -hmm. those five minutes. What are some other things that you recommend to other care yeah. partners? Well, I mean, one of them is just, lowering your standards in terms of what kind of life you can lead. And that sounds horrible. I offend myself by saying it, but 
you know, I used to think, you know, that I could take a class and I could do this and I could do that. And I had to sort of share my energy with myself in more judicious kinds of ways and not expect myself to do everything. And it means, for example, saying no to what neighbors might expect, what other people might expect. In one of my um, conversation guides, I start with the story of a woman who says, every year, all our lives, I've always done Thanksgiving for, you know, a couple dozen people in my house. And I did it this year and they didn't help like they never did. And I did it all and I washed all the dishes myself. And at the end, I just wanted to weep. And she, she, she could have said, I wish she had said no. Because mm. to conserve your energy, you have to say, I, yeah, I could push myself to my limit and do Thanksgiving this year and next year and the year after that. Or I could say, no, it's not good for me. Not him, them. It's not good for me. And so I can't do it. What else can we plan? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that is just such a, it's true for everyone is just being able to, you know it, she knew it, right. She yeah. felt it every, year after year, felt it. Um, but just didn't feel like I, I can say it. I don't, I, I don't have permission to say no. And sometimes, you know, it's just a practice starts with something really simple. Can mm -hmm. you come to coffee? No. Or whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And you get really, and you're like, Oh, that really wasn't that bad. Like, it's okay. The world didn't fall apart. Like I'm still we I can still have a relationship with these people, even if I don't want to, you know, have everyone over for Thanksgiving. And, you know, it's tricky, though, because it may have been that for this person doing Thanksgiving was a source of pride and a mm. source of enjoyment and connection with her family. And so it's a sacrifice. And so you say, nope, I can't do it. And then instead of the family saying, well, of course you can't, hon. You do this. You sit and put your feet up and we're going to take care of your partner and we're going to take care of dinner. And somebody will come and give you a shoulder rub when we're done. You know, that's the caregiver's fantasy. Instead, there's this little trickle of guilt that comes on. Well, why can't you do it this year? Yeah. And one of the things that I've created is, is a document that people can give to family and friends about how PD affects the caregiver and little things that you can do. That's so you, important. You don't have to move in, but you could say, I'm going to the grocery. Do you need anything? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, someone said, uh, thank you, Terry. I have a child that is on the autism spectrum. I am her care provider as well as being her biological mother. Mm -hmm. I'm learning how to say no. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank nice. you. And thank you for being here. It is, this is for, this is for care partners of all different Absolutely. types, right? Absolutely. Because the stories are more similar than they are different. I mean, there are nuances specific to a specific person's life, but for us, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Tracy asks a question that we get very frequently. Mm -hmm. How do you help with the anger? And I can say that we hear that from the care partner's side, and we also hear it from the person with Parkinson's side. And how, so can maybe, maybe talk about both, if you have any experience with both. Um, I, the thought that I have about that is to be angry together at this rotten thing that has happened to you. Um, Love that. You know, you, you can find your favorite expletive and say, you know, drat Parkinson's together and really enjoy the, the, the shared sense of outrage and disappointment and so forth and be, be with your partner in being sad, angry, lonely. And ultimately that, that will change or can change so that you have to do it for both of you. But partly the other thing I would say about how you deal with anger is that you gotta be angry because it's a rotten thing. You know, a lot of times I read materials that say, oh, and you'll find that your neighbors will help and your partner will be so appreciative and so forth. But it's not always that way. Sometimes it's just rotten. And you're entitled to see that and to name it for what it is. And that's the first step towards, towards moving beyond anger is to be as angry as you are. I mean, obviously, you're not going to break all the windows in the house, although you might think about it. But imagine it and then do something healthy to, to, to get the 
the oomph of the, is that right? The oomph, the energy of the anger out of you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I love that. I, Connie and Davis will sometimes do um, together. Like I hate Parkinson's, you know, they're just, we hate it. We hate it. We, we, we hate it. We're going to say we hate it together. We hate it. Um, it here, it's here, but we, we can hate it. Yeah. Um, I wonder just with all of your experience working with lots of different groups of people um, that sometimes that person does not want to um, collaborate on the anger and they want to take the anger out on the care partner, the wife, the, the significant other, the neighbor, the whoever else is around. What, what are some things that um, you've seen people do effectively? Well, I think that being able to name that, to say, you're really angry right now. And I, I, have, I certainly said this to Peter. I said, God, I know, but remember, I didn't give you Parkinson's. And not in a, it's not my fault. So it wasn't that kind of, a, you know, right. combative. And it was, I know. And I didn't give you Parkinson's. And if I could take it away, you know, I would. Take a deep breath. Let them. And, and the weird thing is they can't really show you that they felt the connection that you gave. But you hope that they did feel the connection that you gave. And you sort of have to trust your own intentions. And then when you've done the best you can to connect with their sense of distress, to say, yeah. Because feeling understood is huge. I understand. You're absolutely right to be just as annoyed as you are. And let that be the conversation rather than rushing to the fix. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I think one of the things, uh, you know, we'll get from people with Parkinson's is that their care partner will start to resent them or get angry with them. And a lot of times they'll say, I'm not trying to do X, Y, or Z. And so part of that is just, you know, becoming educated, you know, yeah. as a care partner, be learning that this is, there's cognitive uh, issues at hand. There's, there's facial masking, like we've talked about, there's mm -hmm. confusion, there's uh, talk, you know, speaking issues and the ability to communicate and all of those things. And, the more you know, especially about the motor, mm -hmm. the non-motor symptoms, right? You know, the the less likely you are to, you might get mad, but you might it might take you less time to go back and be like, oh, right, they're, they're not trying to do this. And I I can you can relate this to to anybody who gets sick, right? In any type of yes. of sickness is they are they're they're in fight or flight. They're in that mode all the time. Like they don't have a calming in, in many cases, they never quite calm their system down. And so little things might trigger them and they get upset where they wouldn't get upset. And just being able to say, I think being able to say, yeah, wow, I am angry too. I don't blame you for being angry and just calling it out is a really effective way, at least to diffuse a little bit. It's not going to be perfect, but. I think that's right. But helping them to, and again, a lot of the work does fall on our shoulders, but when our partners become, or our kids become dysregulated, they no longer have the volume control mm -hmm. to bend it down. They no longer have the ability to get back into balance. And so if we can help them get back into balance, that's the job rather than to make them stop being angry and rather than somehow getting to figuring out the, how do I fix this so they won't be angry with me anymore. You can't fix it because you can't fix the reality that, that, that you are both facing together, but you can maybe join them. As I said before, that experience of being understood makes such a difference. Right. But Mel, can I bring up another point that I think is so important? Absolutely. We're talking about relationships that had a kind of built in or, or accumulated sense of well-being. Mm -hmm an accumulated sense of things, um, of mutuality and care and love and trust. But not all relationships are like that. And my heart gets broken when I hear about a care partner who his partner is dealing with all the same par Parkinson stuff or other disability stuff that, that we're talking about. But even before that, they came into a marriage, they were in a marriage or a relationship where there was aggression, hostility, power and control issues that really pre-existed and were frankly abusive or heading towards abuse. And I don't know what I would do 
if my partner had been abusive and I learned to recognize what domestic violence, what abuse looked like, even if it wasn't physical abuse, and then I'm about to pack my bags and set things in place to, to find a life free of that kind of aggression and violence. And then a diagnosis of Parkinson's happens. Do you have to stay? And that is such a hard question. I know the answer, and it's easy for me to give the answer because I didn't have to face this myself, is that I think the best that you can do is to ask yourself, what will I think of myself if I leave? What will I think of myself if I stay? And let that be the question, not should I, not a, am I entitled to, because I don't think anybody should be subjected to controlling, aggressive, humiliating, and, and even violent behavior by somebody else. But it's also hard to leave somebody who is in facing something like Parkinson's, even if they've been awful to you beforehand. And the question is, what do I think of myself for making these various decisions? Yeah. Yeah, that is tough. Uh, so many people have, um, I know, I know a couple of people who were able to get out of marriages um, that, like you said, were not great to begin with. Mm -hmm. And then that happened. And one of the ways that for them that it worked was they removed themselves, but they set something up in place so that this, you know, hey, here's a longer term plan. You can have some care that comes in, but I can't do that. I, ca yes. I can't be the person that my life is, is that, right? Mm -hmm. So, and obviously that's a, um, like a, a, you know, a lucky place to be uh, for some people. Not everybody has, um, will see that they have the ability to do that for whatever reason, you know, income and all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but that is one way to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I know people on the other side who were with a care partner who was not uh, ideal when they got mm -hmm. a Parkinson's diagnosis and said, I'm out of here. I would rather be, right? I'd rather be alone. Mm -hmm. than, um, than be in that situation, even if I could technically count on their care, right? Like I, I know that they would stick around. Uh, I'd rather be alone. So I don't think that's any, you know, that's, they have a lot more things to think about as somebody with Parkinson's than somebody that are, you know, the couple that's disease free, what you would say, but mm -hmm. uh, you still have, you know, dignity and the right to be treated well. So absolutely. Lots absolutely. Of and I think that that's, that's the, the ultimate goal is to have an experience with dignity, even as Parkinson's, because Parkinson's is a very undignified disease at times. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about, you know, the toileting issues and so forth, all of that, which, you know, we, we talk about anything in the Parkinson's world, right? right? Very few things that are off limits in our conversation. But how do you do that with dignity? And I tell a story in the, in the book about, and this is not in the context of Parkinson's, but in the context of my work with adults with cognitive disabilities, about a man who'd had a toileting accident and how the staff person who was working with him managed that situation with an adult man who was, you know, a mess with such dignity. And it, I learned, you know, just watching and observing that, I learned so much about what dignity was, even though this person had an, you know, a complicated and unpleasant thing happening in, in front of me. It wasn't undignified. And that helped guide me in sort of how I worked with Peter at times when he was really angry with me because, and actually it wasn't even angry with me inside me. It was angry and I was there. And um, helping to maintain his dignity and mine. Can you give an example of what you did specifically in a, in a certain case? Yeah. I mean, I remember the situation in which he was really so angry with me and he actually, you know, sort of started building up with what was frustrating him and scaring him and worrying him. And he raised his hand as if to hit me. And you know, I was like, no, don't do that. But what I did was I, and again, because I'd had experience, I sort of knew the, the, the moves. I put my hand on his wrist like this and not to hurt him, but to incapacitate him from hitting me. And I looked dead at him and I said, are you a man who hits his wife? Are you a man who hits his wife? And then I gave him time to process that because it was not something that he was going to respond to instantly, but I'm holding him the whole time. And 
with the way, I mean, and I was really, I guess, thinking pretty hard because it was the way I was using my voice and my engagement with him. And it was sort of drawing on conversations and he knew what I'd done for a living and all of that. And it got through and he said, no. I said, okay, then don't. And it diffused it. Mm -hmm. I did not want to be hit. Right. <laughs> I was really clear about that. Right. And I didn't want for us as a couple to deal with the aftermath of his having hurt me. Right. Because that so you didn't have to berate him in the moment. You didn't have to make him wrong and awful. And yeah. No. And it taught me a, a, something that I talk about. I don't know if I say this in the book, but it's something that I've been thinking about that in some ways think about Parkinson's as, or any disorder as, you know, the situation that is messy and, and prickly and you're reaching in through thorns, but somehow if you can reach through and touch what's left of your partner and then get out of there, you know, just reach in and touch them and then back out so that you can stimulate that, that, that connection, take time, slow down, try to let that connection come back. But you can't, I don't think you can do that if you're, you're wrong and you should and don't, you know, you can't do right. this subtle reaching in. But I think the more I think about this idea of reaching in, I want to think more and write more about that because I think it's a critical technique for hanging on to the sense of connection and sense of dignity in the face of a difficult situation like Parkinson's. Right. It's just that little, that breath and you use, kind of use it with a touch if you yeah. can. Yeah, and even if it's not a physical touch, right. it can be just the way you use your voice, the, the way you recall some positive event in your life. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. You're, we're, you guys are creative people, caregivers, and right. you'll find the way to sort of restore that momentary connection of who you are Yeah, and then give it time to, to ripen. Right. It's hard work. Very hard work, though. Nothing about being a care partner is, is not hard, right? I mean, I think they hear in the good stories we hear about, wow, how, how much it brought us together. We have a better relationship than we've ever had. And we spent more time together and did more and learned more about each other than we may have ever done. Mm -hmm. um, but and those are real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I wish, it, I wish it were that way for everyone, right? But I think that we as care partners can kind of find that. I mean, one, I'll give you one example of something that, that really became a cornerstone when Peter's dementia was pretty, pretty advanced. He and I met around a shared love of opera. And we would sit in the family room of our house and watch one particular performance from the Met Opera, performance of the Barber of Seville. I can practically sing the whole thing now. Um, it was wonderful for him because he knew the music, he knew what was going to happen. It, it, and so the experience of watching this opera gave him a sense of being calm and settled and, and himself in a way that few things did. Mm. And I came to, I would just sit with him and sometimes I'd you know, have a crossword puzzle or be thinking about something I wanted to write or something else with the rest of my mind. But part of me was there with him listening to this music. And, and if you can find something like that, that restores his experience of it or their experience of themselves and then enjoy it with them, you get a little piece of what we miss so often as caregivers. Right. So you said that sort of that question that prompted the book came after he passed. Mm -hmm. What was, what was it like? What was the process of writing the book like? And then what has it been now as it's out into the world and people are contacting you and get in touch with you? Like what, what is your connection to the Parkinson's community these days? Well, I stayed in almost every online Parkinson's community after Peter passed. And I was like, you know, what's wrong with you, girl? You know, get on with your life. But I realized that the things that I was sharing helped people and people were commenting on it. And so I thought, okay, well then maybe I have more to say and started making notes and so forth. And then I don't know, I saw this ad that said, write a book in 30 days <laughs> or, <laughs> and I did, I wrote an outline in 30 days. Wow. 
And that it, it didn't turn into a published book in 30 days, but it turned into something that I thought this is a real project. And then I just kept working on it. And then I kept working on it. And then COVID hit with all the that. And um, I just kept pushing. I kept pushing. And then I, I found this company that helps self-published authors get a book. It's called Paper Raven. And it helps self-published authors get a book that they can feel proud of. And I did. And um, I just did the next step and did the next step. What's been wonderful is how much support I've gotten from the Parkinson's community, from various online groups and Facebook and other places where people have helped me sort through what was the title, what the title should be, and ask questions, you know, did I say this right? Does this really capture your experience? And people were willing to answer those questions. And then I've been really kind of thrilled with how very many people responded. I can't believe that the book was in the hands of 900 people in four days, which shocked me. But it, it sort of validated that there's so much out there about telling you how to take better care of your partner with Parkinson's, your person with Parkinson's. And people say to you, oh, take care of yourself, right? You've heard that. But then the question that comes to us as caregivers is, well, how the heck do I do that? And I wrote this book to be the answer to that. And I think the response has told me that in some ways I've given care partners, caregivers, the answer to that question. This is what it means to take care of yourself and especially to do self-care as opposed to aftercare. Mm -hmm. So what did it do? I can, I can see what it's doing for other people. What did it do for you to be able to write it? I, I like to talk. And it was, <laughs> Keep giving you another platform to talk. Well, yeah, I mean, it gives me the opportunity to share my experience with people and, you know, to, to, to do for other people what a gerontologist did for me. Mm. I'll never forget her. She was a fellow and she looked at me dead on and said, you're doing a really good job. Oh. And no one, no one else had said that to me in that kind of very penetrating, clear, connected way. And it still can almost bring tears to my eyes because I remember how much it meant. And I wow. say to care partners in the book, I know you're doing a really good job or you wouldn't be hey, you reading wouldn't. this book. And so I love the fact that I can say to caregivers, I understand you're, you deserve to, to get help. I wanted to help you find out how to get help. I'm working on a lot of that now. How do you get your family to help? And that you don't have to wear yourself to a thin thread before you get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I hope that everyone will get the book because there are so many great tips um, about, you know, getting, getting the help that you need and getting other people along for the ride, right? Like that's, that's mm -hmm. the difference between uh, living well as a care, guard, care partner, caregiver, and uh, really just kind of flaming out. Right, right. You don't, you don't have to flame out. And not everybody has the resources to, you know, to, to, to hire help, to be able to, to pay for extra resources. But, and that's sort of my other mission is how do we do this for people who don't have their own personal resources? This should be a national priority. Right. Care should be a national priority. Absolutely. Um, well, I am so grateful that you took some time today to talk to us. I know everyone's going to run out and get the book. Uh, um, enjoy it and leave a review. And yeah, yeah I was going to say, don't forget to leave a review, that. reach out, tell her how much you love it. Um, and I uh, guess a lot of thank yous and, and, um, people are appreciating, um, your time and it's been lovely talking to you. So I hope that we can, uh, talk again and I'm sure there, there's more to come in your, your world as a as a post um, Parkinson's care partner. Connie Carpenter says, thanks, Terry, for joining and sharing. I love the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.